I'd like to introduce our next speakers, Jeroen Vendelor and Moritz Thomas. They both work at Inviso out of Belgium. I don't know if Moritz is in Belgium, but I know Jeroen is in Belgium. Uh, Inviso is a fantastic organization. We do a lot of work with them at SANS where uh, they help us develop courseware and they also are our instructors. So obviously our instructors are also our authors, but uh, we got quite a few instructors and authors and Jeroen is currently working on a course on security automation, both offensive and defensive in the cloud. So specifically using automation techniques, but applying that from a security perspective, like in a, a purple kind of approach. So I'm really excited about that course. I'll mention it again a little bit later when I come up before uh, lunch. He also is one of our authors of our Security Essentials 401 course and helps us out there. And he'll be teaching the 598 course when that comes out, probably Q1 of 2022. Uh, Moritz as well, I know he just did a similar talk as this one at the DEF CON ICS Village. And one thing I love about the Inviso talks is they always bring a lot of comedy into their routine. So I'm hoping for a bit of that today, not to put them on the spot. But with that being said, uh, please welcome Jeroen and Moritz. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, for that, uh, for that nice introduction. And indeed, you, uh, well, um, yeah, let, let's try to do it a little bit in a funny way. Of course, uh, I already have like... Uh, a little bit of storytelling, so uh, that will definitely be good. Uh, and once the slides are loaded, then uh, then we can start, of course. Um, I don't know, Moritz, you normally got the controls over the slides, so that could probably already be a funny story if we don't get control over those slides, but here we are. Um, so I'm very proud uh, that we can uh, have this presentation, of course, today. Uh, very sad, of course, that we cannot be present there. Um, for us, I'm actually located indeed in Belgium. Moritz is located in Frankfurt, so uh, so he's actually talking from Germany. Um, and we are going to talk about building an ICS firing range in our kitchen. Well, it's not really in my kitchen, it's actually in Moritz's kitchen, but he will show you some pictures afterwards. So um, yeah, Moritz, uh, you can uh, go and continue, maybe shortly introduce yourself, of course. Um, Okay, perfect. That works, but it was a little bit too quick. So, voila. So, who am I? Um, well, we already had a nice introduction of Steven. Well, I'm uh, Jeroen van der Leur, but within Enviso, I'm service line lead for cloud security and security automation, but also for security exposure. So, everything related to yeah, technological topics um, that are uh, yeah, related to exposure itself. Um, and Moritz, maybe you can introduce yourself also. Sure. Hi, my name is Moritz Thomas. I'm a security consultant at Enviso, and I'm part of their software security assessments team and the research and development team. And uh, in case of this particular project, I've been involved right from the start. Perfect, perfect. So what is Enviso or who is Enviso or who are we? Well, we are actually a cybersecurity firm. We started with five people and nowadays we are with 100 specialized security experts. So over Belgium uh, and, and also in Germany, so a Frankfurt office and Munich. But maybe also important to note is that we do invest a lot in research. And one of these projects is of course, building this firing range for ICS technology. So uh, with that, let's go into the agenda or what we are going to discuss during this uh, presentation. So first of all, yeah, I like to do storytelling. Maybe you've seen previous presentations of me, but I always have a once up in a time uh, story where I try to explain a little bit, okay, what could happen. Then in the second chapter, we will go over the motivation. So why are we actually building this firing range? And in the third stage, we are going to show you how our firing range is working, how we build it, and actually what Thomas already uh, did to, uh, to, to make this uh, project happen. And the fourth uh, stage, we are going to do a little demonstration on, on how it works and what we can do with it. And of course, finally, uh, we will have some conclusions on what we have learned during this project. Normally when I go to conferences, I bring, because I'm from Belgium, I bring Belgian chocolates, but yeah, I cannot attend in real life. So I don't have Belgian chocolates at this moment, but I do have a story that I anonymized via uh, yeah, the chocolate factory from Willy Wonka. So this is based on a real story, uh, but it is also related to ICS or, or definitely ICS, uh, an OT network. Um, and we are going to talk a little bit about how Charlie owned the chocolate factory without having even a golden ticket. So 
One day we got a call from our dear friend, Willy Wonka. I hope you all saw the movie or you at least know the movie, but uh, Willy Wonka is the owner or the CEO of the chocolate factory. And he had a problem. He had a problem with his factory, like the temperature measurements. So actually uh, the, 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 the PLC controls that are measuring the temperature were too high. So the chocolate was melting and they couldn't find the root cause. And he gave us some additional details, like, for example, he started to give away six, uh, five golden tickets. Um, so five golden tickets, he issued them, of course, not the ideal way, but he issued them through mail. A second thing was that the OT network was also isolated. So normally the factor was not directly accessible, accessible. The OT network, therefore, it was filtered, there was isolation, so normally nobody could really penetrate that network directly. They needed to go through some kind of other device. And third, but not the, like, the third thing we had was, of course, an inventory list. So he gave us an inventory list and he said, okay, these are all the components that I know within my OT network, so this is what is going on. So. I don't know what is going on, but please, Enviso, help us here and, and try to do incident response uh, within that environment to see what is going on. After a while, or actually after a couple of hours, it immediately became clear, if we then go to the next slide, that those five golden tickets were potentially a risk. So he gave away five golden tickets, and after our analysis, there was an incident, and we saw that there was even a fake six golden ticket. So we don't know how they actually did it, but it was of course a phishing mail with a fake golden ticket. And there they tried to convene certain uh, OT engineers to click on it and to actually have access towards the network. So what did we do? Of course, yeah, we did an analysis on what um, was actually going on there. So our incident analysis, first thing first, well, we checked the complete inventory list and the inventory list, as in many OT environments, is incomplete. So several devices were missing from that inventory list. We do see that often that from an OT network perspective, that the list is not up to date. We even see it from an IT environment that we know how complex and how difficult it sometimes is to maintain that inventory list. As a second item, we found that also the isolation was not really that well isolated. So they had very weak segmentation in place. So there was a firewall in between the IT and OT network, but of course it's not air gapped and certain OT engineers could jump from the IT to the OT network. So there also misinformation because it was not isolated at that specific moment. Then, of course, the third thing, and we always see that in an OT environment, is a very limited visibility. Once you hop on that OT network, there are no sensors, there is nobody watching you. Um, in, in, in a lot of cases, we see that there are no security uh, sensors on top of that OT network. The only thing we had was the OT firewall, and that one even had no logging available. So, yeah. Again, we don't have any evidence there whatsoever what the attacker did or when. And then last but not least, I already mentioned it, there was a sixth golden ticket and he only issued five. So there was one fake ticket, which of course means there was a phishing mail. And that phishing mail was sent three days before that the temperature measurements were actually uh, changed. Which means, of course, and its potential, I, I know, because that there is no real, um, how do you say it, mapping, because we don't have the logs, we, we, I, the visibility was very limited there. But of course, we can assume that, yeah, that phishing attack was the initial trigger, because an OT engineer who had access to the OT network actually clicked on that link, and actually there were, uh, yeah, there were traces far, found from malicious software. So, as you can see, the incident, we analyzed it, but yeah, we came immediately after a couple of days to the conclusion like, okay, Willy Wonka stopped selling chocolates bars uh, because of course your temperature is not right, but start selling chocolate milkshakes because yeah, we, I, to be honest, your entire network is being compromised because we don't have 
any evidences or any logs, so we need to assume that everything is breached. What were our main conclusions or what were our main challenges, of course? So first of all, well, the inventory list, as I already mentioned, was incomplete, meaning that, that not I, we didn't know what was in there, what was running in that OT environment. So also from a vulnerability management perspective, it was unknown which vulnerabilities were there because there was no inventory. Also, scanning, it was not allowed, meaning that we couldn't scan for vulnerabilities or for potentially uh, certain things that can be exploited in that OT network. Why is it typically not allowed? Well, if you scan, then you could affect certain operational tasks or activities, which of course is not our intention. So we don't want to interfere with production. And typically you are not allowed to actively scan on such network. Then third, ITOT traffic filtering. Well, in many cases, there is a firewall in place. It's a dedicated one, but then you see that there are so many rules opened up that actually the firewall doesn't make sense anymore. And even logging, if logging is not enabled, then probably that's also an issue there. So check that firewall. And that's typically also some of the things we see uh, that is not configured well yet. Then fourth point was already mentioned, limited feasibility. So indeed within an OT network, there are custom protocols sometimes, or there are very specific protocols that there is no real protocol visibility, or if your inventory is incomplete or you cannot scan, you don't know what's really going on within that network. And that's of course crucial for in incident analysis, but also to protect your network, of course. And then if we then look into the, the fifth element, which is, no simulation environment. So if you can protect your production network or if you can test on your production network, you of course want to have some kind of simulation environment, but that's typically not available. Why? Well, it's very specific um, and it's also sometimes very expensive. So the simulation environment in many cases should solve a lot of problems there already, but uh, in many cases it's also just not feasible. And then last but not least, and that actually was the initial breach in the OT network. So the inventory list was not complete and we didn't have any visibility, but what we found was via a physical uh, network patch, we found that there was a Samsung TV connected towards that OT network. God knows why, uh, but in any case, that resource was unknown and nobody could mention who actually plugged in that smart TV and there was an initial exploit vulnerability that the attackers abused to then penetrate into the network and to gather additional information about the OT network. So in essence, I think this already uh, yeah, summarizes a lot of issues. And that's also why we are nowadays building a firing range. So that was also our initial trigger to have actually yeah, an initial motivation for using a firing range as a research and development project. So what is actually a firing range? Well, a firing range or a cyber range is first of all a control and interactive environment. So something that you have in control of, but that you can interact with, interact with to check certain things. It, in most cases, must be the same environment that you have as in your production environment. So meaning that you have a similar setup that is in, for example, the chocolate factory. You also want to use those firing ranges, not only to attack the firing range or to know how it works, but also to detect and mitigate those attacks. So what can you see there and how can you attack certain things within an ICS firing range? And you can then choose for a pre-existing firing range, which have common, uh, common technologies and common PLC controllers, or you can also use and we are going to talk about a custom built one here then for, uh, yeah, to, uh, Moritz will, uh, will, will of course explain that more in detail. So that actually sums it up for what the fire range actually is for us and also why we are going to use it within cybersecurity. Um, I think there we typically, uh, we have defined four typical use cases. So if you uh, yeah, go to the next slide. So there we have defined five typical use cases. One of those use cases is, of course, awareness. Why? Because, yeah, Willy Wonka, if we talk about, okay, but do you know that attackers can change your temperature? It's really a theoretical message. If we then can show it in real life that we can 
maybe change the lights or something else. Well, that has a visual impact also towards director level. And you can then show, okay, this is really something we need to tackle. Same for testing purposes. Eh? So if you want to test a patch or if you want to do security testing, probably you don't want to do it in production. You do want to do it in a firing range, of course. And development, so for detection and forensic readiness, I think there a lot has to be learned still. And we need to know, okay, what can we detect? Where are those logs? And what do we see within those protocols? Also from a forensic readiness, what do we need to save and centralize from a logging perspective? So that's definitely also a crucial use case. And then last but not least, training, of course. So to train our people, customers, but to train also OT engineers and all cybersecurity experts that are interested in uh, IECS. Well, probably it's a good idea to try and test and, and use such firing range ranges. So we have done this before already, but it was rather limited. Now it's a little bit more. So our first ride with ICS or OT or operational or OT environments were actually like a hack the train model. So we traveled around to Europe with a train and then we actually said, okay, you can try to hack it, this and, and have an impact on how the train reacts on certain things. So that's what we did initially. But then of course, yeah, we now went next level and Thomas is going to talk a little bit more, uh, sorry, Morris is going to talk a little bit more about uh, these things um, and on how we built an ICS firing range. Um, and actually we, we, we yeah, build a water bridge in that case. So how we build an ICS firing range of a bridge in our kitchen. So Thomas, go ahead. All right, thanks, I do. So let me tell you this story of ours. So it all had a beginning, right? So there was mid 2020. Uh, there we conceived the idea of building a firing range for our own, for training, for internal training, right? And we had the scenario of the water treatment plant that we wanted to realize there because it's, it's very tangible. You can grasp the concept rather easily, I would say. And that's what we started with. Uh, here on the right hand side, you can also see the hardware that we built so far. So there was an 80 kilogram steel electric cabinet there with uh, some OT equipment and some networking equipment. And uh, actually for the scenario, it also reached some point of maturity, some level. So here you can see the, the physical setup there with the filtration units. So that part of the water treatment plant, we recorded this in our kitchen near the sink because it was leaking a lot. Um, it was not much fun working on that, to be honest, because it was not nice. So, But then at some point, Inviso was commissioned by the uh, Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management uh, from the Netherlands. They saw what we did and basically said, OK, this looks nice. We want to have something similar for our TFIR team. Uh, but we want to have this as a mobile solution. And we want to have this in a scenario-based manner so that we can um, train different scenarios and, and look at different kill chains, for example. But also to, to fit the, the scheme, uh, to fit the, the, the scene, actually, they wanted us to build a bridge model instead of a water treatment plant. So we did our research. We identified crucial components of such bridges, of BESCO bridges. And we actually developed a 3D model that we were going to 3D print. So here you can see in the middle our CAD model uh, and our individually uh, printed parts. And there in the corner, actually, as the title says, we printed this in my kitchen, actually, much to the dismay of my wife, to be honest, because it was very loud and took up a lot of space. But due to COVID, this was a very good uh, option because it allowed us to iterate even faster. 3D printing itself allows you to iterate quite quickly by doing so in your own kitchen, certainly steps it up a notch. But OK, what are you going to do when you just printed this model? Of course, you're going to put everything together into a real physical firing range. So we just did that. We assembled two of those models. And then for the firing range itself, it should be mobile, right? Um, we built an aluminum frame with a steel plate that then, mount, then holds all the OT components. And we installed all those OT components. Uh, you might notice those are mostly Siemens PLCs because they were the most relevant for our scenario there. Um, but of course, then we went ahead and installed the models. We added the panels to the, to the frame to make it look nice, right? We wired everything together, which was a bit of a mess, as you might see here, but it worked eventually. 
And we did a lot of testing, of course. When I say a lot of testing, I mean it. We did a, an awful lot of an awful lot of testing. Uh, here you can even see an oscilloscope that we needed to debug some uh, some timing on the signals of motor drivers there, which was off, but that allowed us allowed us to fix it. So now we have the physical build, but that doesn't get you very far in in the means of uh, digital forensics. So we needed an infrastructure behind that that powers it actually. And this should be a, um, a somewhat realistic environment and it should be extensible. So that's what we designed next. Here you can see a very simple network infrastructure diagram, right? Um, the dash rectangle actually indicates that those networks are virtualized. They're running on an ESXi host. And I'll just go through those very, very quickly. So all of those have in common that they use an OPN sense internally for routing and as a firewall. And let's start with the enterprise network. That's basically just a Windows environment that has a domain controller and a domain joint office workstation that usually we abuse as an initial foothold. And we have a Grafana server, which is a visualization front end that allows us to visualize the process data. Then in the SCADA network, we have an operator workstation that allows us to monitor the process actually going on in the OT network. We have an InfluxDB server instance, which is our historian that actually grabs the process data. And we have a jump host that allows us to connect to the engineering workstation in the OT environment to there then do maintenance and deploy programs. The DMZ pretty much uh, is empty. We planned to initially put some Windows update server in there, but for our scenario, this was overkill, so we didn't. And then the OT network obviously has all the fun physical parts. So we have a bunch of PLCs that you saw earlier. Uh, notably here is the S7-1500 Siemens PLC, which we use as an orchestration device. So this actually relays data to the historian, but it also instructs all the other PLCs. Okay, uh, now we had our hardware, we had our software, we had it all running. So let me show you a video about it. So what it actually looks like now and what we put in there. Let's see if that works. Sweet. So here you can actually see the models on top, as I showed you earlier. And then in the bottom, there's our OT equipment. And there we actually have an HMI that contains UI elements that represent all the essential parts in the model above. So there we can control various parts. Uh, the 3D models are actually driven by stepper motors, as you can see here. And there's also quite a lot of air ventilation going on so that, the, that those motors don't overheat. It was a big issue in our, first, in our first iteration. And down here, we actually got our E6i host, which is just sitting in a regular desktop tower. Also, a rather big uh, OT switch was just there. And that's the full walk around of the model. So let's see if I can get the overlay for controls again. Sweet. So right, as I said, here you can see the HMI. Uh, there are individual UI elements for the central parts of the bridge model up there. So here we got pedestrian lights, we got maritime traffic lights. We can control the individual road barriers or road gates. And we can control, of course, the big bridge Pesco leaf, Pesco bridge leaves. Then inside, we have quite a lot of wiring going on. And as I said, the big stepper, stepper motors. And then in the back, there's the desktop uh, case actually containing the E6i host. There is an, uh, actually an access point sitting there for easier access to the whole build to do some administration or to do maintenance on it. And of course, there's a big switch that we use to connect all the physical devices. Okay, so with that, we could already do something, but question remains, what would you actually do with that? Mm -hmm. So you want to, to actually gain something from building this. You want to put it into action. So we decided to do some R&D on it. And we figured, okay, imagine you have the situation uh, at Acme Enterprise Solutions. You have just a regular enterprise network with let's say some servers and some workstations, then a malicious actor comes along, compromises those systems, leaves, and you are being called as the DFIR guy to then do your job on it. 
Well, the good thing is that the, that the methodology that you apply there is sound and it's proven that it works, it's okay. But figure that you are in another scenario, that you're now in a production plant. Now it's not servers and, and workstations that were compromised. Now it's also POCs and other production devices. So what are you going to do here? Here, one of the problems is that, is that for forensics, you can't just disconnect those devices. They might, for example, implement some crucial functionality, maybe safety related. Um, they might not even be easy to, 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 actually, to actually find physically where they are located at. So that might be a problem, right? When you try to, to get your evidences, for example. So let's see what has been done in terms of research for that. Uh, actually, there has been some quite interesting research been conducted by Abessi and Chanowski in 2019 and also Weber in 2019. But those approaches were mostly very invasive. They reverse engineered, for example, the bootloader of those devices of specifically one specific device. And they managed to, for example, uh, gain remote, then direct code execution on those devices. But as I said, this is pretty invasive. In some cases there, you even had to pry open the device and then attach your devices, your equipment to it. That's usually not very, let's say feasible for a forensics investigation. So we thought, okay, let's maybe go a different way. So maybe let's go more software oriented way. And there we came up with a three stage program to do that with a, with a small R and D program there. So we figured, okay, when POCs get their code and execute it, they have a similar understanding in air quotes uh, as native code does, right? When you compile C and C++ code, a lot of metadata is gone missing, for example, the variable names. And without this, it's hard to make sense of the data. Of course, you can reverse engineer, but that's hard. You don't wanna do that, right? So we figured, okay, let's maybe get in a first step all the metadata of a POC and of the program running on it and as we were working with Siemens POCs mostly, we went and uh, used the, the TIA openness API of the IDE that we use for programming POCs with Siemens, which is TIA. And we can use that to dump a whole lot of metadata about this project and a whole dump of very specific data such as what are the devices being used? What are the, the variables being used? And at what memory address, uh, what memory address holds what values? That's very crucial. Because in the next step, we can make use of this metadata and of some open source libraries to connect to those POCs and dump raw data, because that's all we get from those POCs. And taking this raw data and, and interpreting and deserializing it with metadata leaves us with then structured live data that we can make sense of. And then in the third stage, we would go and perform two diffs. We would perform, we would perform a diff, right, of two states, one state would be the live data at a good known state, right? And the second state we would then dump when there was a compromise. And when we did that, we could theoretically see what's been happening there, what were some essential changes. So we did that. We implemented the tool. And here in the first step, you can actually see that it just dumps the data. And there on the right-hand side, you can see the JSON that it outputs. And we receive a JSON file of the static metadata. In the second step, we run the tool again, but say, okay, use this static data that we acquired before and get a live data dump. And it does that and it shows that to you and it then dumps it again into another file, right? Then we do this twice and then we can actually compare those files. And here will, it will then output to you what were the differences that it found there. But of course, um, those of you who know the topic will now maybe scream and say, oh my God, that's not that easy. Of course it's not. Uh, let me say there are a few caveats here. Um, it's not a silver bullet in itself. It has some specific, I said, it has some specific requirements that have to be met in order to be used, right? But that's still an R&D topic. And I think it's quite a nice progress there. And with that, I then hand over to Jeroen for our conclusions. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Moritz, for uh, for this uh, demonstration and, and how it actually works in real life. Um, and related to that, yeah, I just want to go over quickly over the conclusions. So, so what were our main challenges here, or main conclusions? It's not really related to to building an ICS firing range, but ICS or OT networks in general. So, I think 
what you've already seen, like we need to grab an, a known good state and then we need to compare uh, when, when a system is attacked, we need to compare the configuration again. So that there are no real, at this moment, there are no, no real forensic tools for those PLC controls that we are now using for our specific scenario. So we really needed to custom develop and, and write our own tooling to read out those values and to actually then do the comparisons, which of course is a little bit immature if we, if we look at forensics like Windows events and, and um, disk image copies and all those other tools that we are nowadays using for forensics in IT environments. And I think yeah, we still have a long way to travel there. You do have some specific vendors that are good in placing sensors and agents, but that's not always yeah possible, especially not on PLC controls. So it's still a little bit like in development, and and we are building also also with our team, we are building further on it to to actually get this in a more mature manner. Then I think yeah, two main conclusions there also is be prepared at a technical level. So. If you have an OT network, well, see that your people are trained, see that you have technical installations and configurations, that those are documents, that you know what is running on there, and that you actually are yeah, aware of what is in your OT environment. Maybe if you have a test environment or if you can test with, with those controllers or with those specific objects, try to create your own tooling. So, own tooling sorry. So something we did with the S7 dump. Um, so that you can actually get data and get metadata from your ICS environment from those components itself. So that's really from a technical level, but also from an organizational level. Um, if I go back to the story I told you about uh, our dear friend Willy Wonka, Willy Wonka, well, the phishing incident was actually the initial trigger. And in a lot of cases, there is always a compromise within the IT network, unless you made the choice to directly connect your OT network to the internet, but in most cases, that's not really um, yeah, uh, uh, the scenario. So in, in, in a lot of incidents we saw with OT networks, there, there's always an initial intrusion in the IT network. So I think their roles and responsibilities should be made more clear and definitely the communication between IT and OT uh, needs to upscale. They, they both need to communicate more and they also need to train each other a little bit on, okay, this is how our, our environment works and this is how we typically access our environment. And IT also needs to inform OT more like, okay, these are typically the security controls we have in place to protect ourselves. So I think there definitely, there is some work still to be done uh, because OT and IT in most cases nowadays, we see that it's a little bit separated or isolated from each other on a communication level then, not on a technical level. So, <laughs> But in any case, yeah, I think th those are our three main conclusions. And if you are uncertain, of course, yeah, do not wait too long to call in external help. It's a very specific topic, as you saw during our demo. Uh, but I think, yeah, you can definitely call call vendors or call organizations who have experience with ICS um, to help out on these and to get more insights in your OT environment. So with that, um, I think those were our main conclusions. I want to thank you uh, for following our presentations. I hope it was a little bit interesting. I hope we could set some, uh, some of those expectations like Stephen already, that there were some funny sentences in our presentations or not. But in any case, um, yeah, this um, I, I, I want to thank you for, for uh, attending our meeting and uh, I think we now have some time left still for a Q&A, of course.